Good evening. Unsurprisingly, Gresham lectures about law are less well attended than lectures about astronomy or music or even mathematics. Unsurprisingly, because frankly, if I had the choice, I'd probably choose against the law and go to one of the others. Because they tell you about the essence of being a human being. Law only tells you about how you control what we have become. My lectures to date have dealt with the way or the degree to which law can invade the arena of armed conflict, either by formal systems of crime and punishment, or, as in the last lecture dealing with Vietnam, by informal ones. Informal tribunals, and we're going to look at two this evening, deal with the law, take it as a given, and say that it is universal. But, of course, they can do no more. In their hands, the law has no power. They resemble, to informal tribunals, to a degree, campaign groups. Does that mean that their only influence, and they're an increasing feature of modern life, that their only influence is over public opinion? Well, it's certainly interesting, isn't it, to look back on Lord Russell's tribunal into Vietnam, where the conclusions were probably right, but the effect so far is very limited. Ask an American how she or he would categorize the activity in Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos, and the words war crime will not leap to the mouths of most of your friends. Had there been a Nuremberg or a Tokyo-style trial with people lined up and convicted, reaching the same conclusions as Russell may have reached. And, of course, the conclusions and the observations would be entirely different. So I want to look at tonight really at what is the law, given the way it is used by informal tribunals. The first, which we will deal with very briefly, is the Japanese Comfort Women Tribunal, formerly the Women's International War Crimes Tribunal for the Trial of Japanese Military Sexual Slavery. It deals with events before the Vietnam War. It came into being after the Russell Tribunal. We now know with absolute certainty what the so-called comfort women suffered. Chronologically, I can deal with it swiftly. In 1932, as part of its uh, process of controlling the Asia-Pacific region, Japan set up comfort houses in Shanghai where the military could have sexual pleasure. It became institutionalized at the rape of Nanking in 1937, and as many as 200,000 women, and I'm going to list the countries they were from and the places in which they were located for a good reason. They came from Japan, Korea, China, the Philippines, Burma, Dutch East Indies, Netherlands and Australia, and they provided what they provided for the military in Manchuria, Taiwan, Borneo, the Philippines, Singapore, Burma, Indonesia and Korea, as well as Japan. Why do I mention that? This activity did not go unnoticed or unrecorded. The comfort houses, as they were called, and this is men waiting to go to one, were not commercial brothels. They institutionalized serial rape, not prostitution, and the Japanese army was heavily involved. There was a belief that sex before combat was a charm against injury as well as a, as a relief for soldiers in, before or after combat. 
They could control, it was argued, sexually transmitted disease and reduce the rape of local women, which was damaging to the Japanese reputation. Some prostitutes did choose to work. Some were sold into the business, but demand outstripped supply. And there is simply no doubt but that people were rounded up, kidnapped for this work. Once rounded up, the women could be required to serve 60 to 70 men a day, not infrequently killed by the soldiers, often wounded, and prevented from committing suicide as a way out because the Japanese government and military said they would harm their families if they did so. That is what this episode was all about. And the truth emerged um, over time, but much later, but I'll deal with it out of time. This chap, Yasui Kaneko, and we'll now have a, a one-minute clip from him, which we'll have to read, um, told the truth about these events in 1996, recorded in the Washington Post, and here's a little passage that you can see. I don't know if it's on all screens. He's a grandfather at the time, 87 years old. <laughs> 올해 여든 일곱 살의 가네코 야스기 할아버지, 1940년 20대 젊은이로 중국 산동성의 전장에 기관총 사수로 참전했습니다. 현지에서 직접 본 위안부들의 비참한 모습은 지금도 기억에 생생하다고 말합니다. 아무 자만에 저도 하시서 돈에 하스카시 하스카시들 혼돈이 혼돈하고 무자마다요. 이간에 헤이다다 두나란데 이지라티 혼나시도 안 했고. また押し上げたぼうって言われる。それで一回たぶん一回二三分で終わりで、ちゃかちゃかたって終わり。はい、次に出るで。ウィアンボ川で一部の部で音で人間周りへと直接ナプチオン女性たちが来て、ちゃか
and a near apology was offered by a Japanese Prime Minister. Sometimes people, particularly in, in informal tribunals and in NGOs, speak as if there is universal law that lies behind the various things we do. I'm not so sure. But there is one universal law. Never own up. It's given false credibility by the phrase right against self-incrimination or the right to silence. That's the law that was operated by Japan. And so this informal tribunal, um, well-funded, came into being with extremely uh, senior judiciary. So that's the Japanese uh, trial. You can come there. There's the front page of the judgment of the tribunal that came to deal at the end of the 1990s and in 2000 with what had happened in the comfort stations. And uh, I must deal quite swiftly, but it was a proper court and it found its authority. How could it find its authority? You probably can't read that. What it said was um, that its authority came not from a state or intergovernment organization, but from the peoples of the Asia-Pacific region and the peoples of the world to whom Japan owed a duty. It went on to say, again, you won't be able to read that, but part of it at the bottom uh, in the verdict was that they found the emperor himself, the man MacArthur had saved, guilty of criminal negligence in respect of rape and sexual slavery. And then if we turn over uh, to the way they expressed themselves, the tribunal, seized of evidence, said this. One of the greatest unacknowledged and unremedied injustices of the Second World War. No museums, no graves for the unknown comfort women. No education for future generations. No judgment for the victims of Japanese military sexual slavery and the rampant sexual violence. This is what had been going on. And this is what no one had owned up to and everybody tried to avoid revealing. Finally, in a rather powerful phrase at the end, the bit I've highlighted, while the names inscribed in history's pages have been at best those of the men who commit the crimes or who prosecute them, rather than the women who suffer them, this judgment bears the names of the survivors who took the stand to tell their stories and thereby for four days at least put wrong on the scaffold and truth on the throne. The reversal of the poetic line. And here's the reaction of some of those very brave women who told the story and allowed this informal tribunal to bring that much-needed result. Did it have any effect? No. Were they recompensed, apart from by a secret slush fund to which the Japanese government contributed in order not to lose the honour of making a confession? No. So as we look at informal tribunals, and I must now pass to the second one with which we are going to spend more time, the informal Iran tribunal that sat in 2012. And as you think about what the law is and what informal bodies can do with the law, thus far we've seen Vietnam and now a rapid counter through the events of this Japanese um, comfort women's tribunal. The Iran Tribunal was the creation of the diaspora of Iran who sought justice for those imprisoned, tortured and executed by the revolutionary regime of Khomeini in the 1980s. The international community is unable to deal with Iran. It's too toxic, it's too dangerous. The law doesn't really run there. Nobody's tried to make it do so. The Iranian Revolution saw a Western semi-absolute monarchy replaced by an anti-Western authoritarian theocracy where the supreme leader had unlimited powers as sole interpreter of God's given laws. His decisions overrode the country's written laws despite the fact that by, a member, by being a member of the United Nations and signed up to the Charter, um, Iran owed all sorts of legal duties, 
to people of all genders and both genders and um, to minorities of all kinds, to races of all kinds, uh, and to people who might otherwise disappear, the disappeared. Uh, it also owed duties under customary international law that made it the state responsible for internationally recognised crimes of those working for it. After taking power in February 1979, many members of the previous regime and opposition were arrested. Many were swiftly executed. Thereafter, a policy through the 1980s of summary executions with unlimited powers resting in Islamic judges brought a reign of terror to a country not so very much further from our shores than those parts of the distant Adriatic to which we go on our holidays. The informal Iran tribunal, in which I had a small part, had two hearings, one in London, one in The Hague, one called a commission, one called a tribunal. Its importance includes that it reflected the modern technological age. Much of the evidence from 100 witnesses was taken by Skype at low cost. The proceedings themselves were pl played straight back under whatever barriers there may have been into Iran. Iran couldn't stop many hundreds or it may be thousands of people viewing these proceedings which were conducted by immensely senior judiciary who gave their time free uh, and whose judgment is really unimpeachable. Of course Iran was invited to take part and of course it didn't. A summary of the evidence not to shock you but because it's necessary to frame what's going to come thereafter. Most of the arrests occurred in the early 80s. Um, physical torture was widely reported. Children as well as adults were tortured. Particular forms of torture included bastinado, where you're beaten on the feet with thick electric cable so that your feet swell impossibly and you cannot walk. Your feet have to be cut in order that they can uh, become usable again. More of that later in two unappealing ways. Uh, some witnesses, m many, underwent this particularly horrible form of torture. It's a uh, drawing, so I hope it's not too disturbing, called, I think it's pronounced Gapani, where you're tied in that way, you're dragged up from the floor, suspended, sometimes with weights attached to your feet, you're beaten, and your shoulders uh, dislocated and or broken, you're left permanently uh, injured. Prisoners were forced to stand still for, say, 72 hours, sometimes on ice, sometimes blindfolded. They were forced to squat in boxes that had the dimensions, open boxes, of a coffin. More of those later as well. So you'd have in a, in a given room, you'd have lots of little coffins all the way around the room, and people were squatting there, silent. But as I say, more of that later. Um, prisoners were subject to mock executions. Blanks were used, or they were lined up with people who were really going to be executed. Some blanks, some, sorry, marked that they shouldn't be shot, others going to be shot. They were made to listen to other prisoners being tortured. I infants were beside their parents when they were interrogated. Parents could hear their children screaming when they were being tortured. It was, quite literally, a form of hell, one would imagine. There was, induct uh, there was uh, religious indoctrination, blindfolding, all sorts of other horrors. You can read some of them in the handout. Of those sentenced to death, some only learned of their sentence as they were led to the scaffold. It was either by shooting or by hanging, and I mean hanging slowly. Rape of women and boys was common. One boy aged 16 was reported as being raped every night by the guards. And apart from these general bits of treatment of those who may have been political opponents, there was also racial or, if you like, ethnic treatment 
adverse to the Arabs, the Kurds, the Turkmens, the Azeris, and the Baluchis. And the Baha'is. Iran is the birthplace of the Baha'i, 600,000 followers, their rights denied them. And as one was able to say, because he or she survived, the judge imposing the death sentence on them said it was their clear expressed wish to kill every Baha'i, to do it one at a time so that the international community might not notice it. Arabs were badly treated, some of them, both of Shiite and Sunni faith. And one witness was Yalil Shanani, who was 13 years old at the time. His father, uncle and brother were taken away on one day and within a day they were dead, simply for belonging to that tribe. They had no political interest or associations at all. Kurds were the subject of oppression. One of the ten Kurdish witnesses heard by the tribunal was Malaka Mustafa Sultani, who gave detailed evidence as to the execution of four of her brothers, whose butchered bodies were returned, the head of one being dropped in her lap. Sexual violence was rampant. Many women were raped before being executed because if you execute a virgin, the virgin goes to heaven. And that it appeared, came from a fatwa of one of the ayatollahs. Let me turn to one or two more matters of detail, and then a complete change. Torture was sufficiently effective, as one witness, a man, Irai Mezdagi, explained, that victims were pressured into participating uh, in televised confessions, not to achieve escape, but because that would bring them more rapidly to execution and save them from further torture. The same witness explained to me when I looked at one of his beautifully drawn diagrams of the prisons, and I asked, what on earth is an infirmary doing here? And he said, oh, well, they had nurses. Why do they have nurses? Because the bastinado on the feet damages the kidneys to such an extent you need dialysis, they would give you a form of dialysis to keep you alive, to torture you more. That is what was going on, ladies and gentlemen, in the 1980s in Iran. Shikufe Saki, who will be joining us from Canada by Skype, was arrested on the 12th of August of 1982. She was a very young woman, but she married with a very young son. And her husband and brother and his wife were also arrested. She was kept in prisons for many years. At her trial, so-called, a couple of minutes of an exercise to which she was led blindfolded, had the so-called judge reading the charges to her, to which she said, but this is all rubbish. This is what I did as a... As a school student, these aren't crimes. She stood up for herself. He asked her if she repented, and she said, repent for what? Well, she was sentenced to life, subsequently reduced, with lashes, subsequently reduced to five years. She spent several years, in th the following years, in three of Tehran's prisons. And we can now, I hope, see her. I sent her some questions uh, in advance that she will answer. The first ones, or I hope very briefly, about one minute each. I don't know what the answers are, and then at the end we'll have time to discuss things, including to ask questions of her. Shkufi, good evening. On arrest and at trial, what, if anything, did you think about the law of your own land? or the international law, if you had any conception of what it was? Good evening, first. Mm. On the, my arrest, I had no sense of law. Law didn't exist for me, uh, or at that time, what we had, it was issuing of decrees every once in a while, um, and that was it. So I had no sense of the Iranian law, and nothing, no clue about the international law. And in the trial, 
the only thing I could think of was that my activities were be, be, belonged to the time prior to even those decrees coming from the Islamic body, I mean, supreme leaders or anybody. So I thought that that would be my defense, which was wrong. That was it. Thank you very much. On the 1st of September 1983, Shakufi was moved in from the prison where she was, uh, first of all to a very small room, but then she was moved into a room where they had these open coffins, or coffin-shaped spaces, where you're divided from the next person. Um, she, as a woman, was forced to wear the shadur all day, to face the wall all day. Uh, you, uh, yeah. To face the wall all day, and at night to lie head to toe with the person next door to you so that you couldn't speak. Beaten, they had um, loud playing of propaganda at them throughout the day. Shikufe would tell you, and it's I think set out in the footnote of the notes, the detail of one of the things that she did they had to be allowed to go to the loo. They took a thread from her covering at night, head to toe. The thread could be passed from one to the other. One person could write on the other person's foot over the, or may have been under the div divisor, a letter of the alphabet. In our case, it would be A, B, and indicate by a number of tugs, what Morse code they were going to use. And that's what they did. And a large number of the women were able to use Morse code, not just by, by bits of material, but by knocking on walls, by using light and shade to communicate in circumstances where communication was otherwise completely barred. The warden of the prison clearly thought that these cells would destroy the will of people and create from them more of the people who converted and became fellow travellers with the regime. He thought that he was creating um, a whole new cadre of people starting from scratch who would fall in with what was wanted of them. He was, as you will have already detected, unsuccessful, at least in respect to some people. More than 200 leftist female prisoners and a number of Mujahideen supporters, which was one of the groups working, uh, operating in that area, were subject to these procedures. And the process that Shakufi went through lasted overall for some nine months. Most broke down, others with unyielding will, like Shakufe, didn't. And my second question to Shakufe is this. When you were in the coffins, Shakufe, what, if anything, did you think about the laws of the world that had not saved you from this? No. Didn't exist. In the coffin, it's you and the whole power with everything that it has against you. Uh, nothing outside of those walls didn't exist. No. Nope. Thank you. Countless, or nearly countless, political prisoners were executed in Iran between 1980 in 1988, all over the country. Generally, those executions followed a court order and a nominal, if any, trial. Bodies weren't returned, accounts weren't given to loved ones, 
and so on. Minors were not exempt from the executions of the 1980s. The lowest recorded by the tribunal uh, was of a boy aged 11 who was hacked. The estimate is of over 15,000 summary executions between 1981 and 1988. All of this is in the judgment of the Iran Tribunal. It's readily available on the internet, as incidentally is, if you look slightly more difficult to find, the, the, the 300-page judgment of the earlier tribunal. I should have mentioned that at the time. But all this material is available for you to assess. In 1988, at the conclusion of hostilities with Iraq, the military wing of the People's Mujahideen of Iran made an incursion into Iran, of Iraq. They made an incursion into Iran from Iraq, but they were defeated. The government used this as a pretext for issuing a fatwa condemning to death members of that group who had not repented of their past sins. Um, the, I think the fatwas are quoted in the handout and they're here, but I'm concerned about time. The, the, this fatwa, which you can read here, the middle bit, those who remain steadfast in their position of hypocrisy in prison through the country are considered to be waging war on God and are thus condemned to a sentence of death. And then the last line, gentlemen who are responsible for making the decisions mustn't hesitate. They must try to be ferocious against infidels. To hesitate in the judicial process of revolutionary Islam is to ignore the pure and holy blood of the martyr. But by this time, 1988, Shakufe was in a prison with a different regime. In July, when the United Nations ceasefire became effective, the Iraq-Iran uh, ceasefire, the news was announced and they expected that they were going to be released. In fact, the reverse happened. Such privileges as they by then had were withdrawn. They were back in Shadows and they were separated from the Mujahideen. One of the Mujahideen inmates was able to communicate with Shakufe to explain that the Mujahideen were being tried specially and the outcome of those trials was obvious. They were to be and were executed. Indeed, Shakufe was in the process of having a Morse conversation with the woman who gave her this information at the moment, the woman was taken away, never to be in contact again. Once the Mujahideen were dealt with, it was the time of the leftists, such as um, Shakufe and uh, others of her political inclination at the time. And they then heard of death, uh, death commissions. They heard about it via Morse code. They understood that they would be confronted by members of these commissions, three I think typically, at each prison, and they would be asked simple and silly questions in a way, not silly in light of their consequences, and if they didn't answer in the way that was wanted of them, then the fate was inevitable. All of these women and all of these prisoners were living under the constant threat of execution. Third question to Shakufe. How, with all these things that you had suffered, Shakufe, did you manage to maintain your mental state intact? Uh, you mean during the whole prison time? Yes, and particularly yes. now that the of the 1988 executions is upon you? Uh, it's more of a... I can't say that in... It's more of that you don't have a choice. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to... And it's uh, knowing that that's the will of the system and of the prison to destroy you. Uh, every moment or everything you do, it's, uh, it's an attempt to keep yourself intact, uh, 
uh, your sanity and your integrity uh, and your identity. Uh, that could be from keeping your solitary cell clean, and which really um, infuriated the guards because they didn't like to see that, that you have a control of your space, to uh, keep thinking, keep uh, being conscious of what was happening and being conscious of uh, where you were standing and having a control over your own sense of being and over the truth of your position. Uh, I can say more, but I don't think there's time here. Thank you. In addition to Shikufe's evidence and lots of other evidence from victims and uh, eyewitnesses, the tribunal, uh, the informal tribunal, the Iran tribunal, had evidence from Professor Copithorne, who'd been the United Nations Special Rapporteur, able once to get into Iran at the beginning of his term of office, never thereafter, hearing, as he explained, little more than rumor about the terrible things that were happening, at least little more at that time. But what he explained, uh, as somebody kno knowing the United Nations, is that in any event, getting an official investigation into abuses of the 1980s would never be easy. You'd never have full support of everyone on the Human Rights Commission. Just like the wartime experience of the women in Japan. Is there law? Or is it always a matter of choice? Professor Copithorne ended his testimony and it became one of the recommendations of the tribunal that there should be a formal commission of inquiry set up by the United Nations into these events because that is one way in which the United Nations makes it harder for itself to do nothing if the inquiry comes up with recommendations of a certain kind. Another expert witness we called was a Mrs Burley, very senior representative of Amnesty International, who'd assembled um, information from many sources and many reports and was able to give supporting evidence to the otherwise entirely consistent evidence coming to the tribunal. That then brings me towards uh, the end of what I need to say because I want you to have time to question, not so much me, I suspect, the Shakufe. But let me say a little bit more about the Iran tribunal and a little bit about its conclusions. The Iran tribunal is a social movement initiated by a group of individuals, families of the victims, um, survivors of mass executions, uh, political activists, women's rights activists, and so on. And it demonstrates the power of the ordinary citizen, particularly assisted by modern technology, because people could be put together, funds could be raised, meetings could be held, if necessary, by telephone rather than actually physical meetings. And little by little, but actually in a short period of time, chaired by um, uh, an extremely efficient uh, and uh, <coughs> excellent person who's with us here tonight, it was it was possible to drive this thing forward. Well, no, he wasn't the chairman. He was the effective chairman <laughs> um, in some ways. And it, it came forward. And so we were able to have, first of all, this hearing in the east of London where uh, a, so, uh, a truth commission sat and prepared a report from about 70 witnesses. They prepared that report and then they handed that on to the judges in The Hague. The judges had that. They also had further evidence, and they were then able to make their conclusion. Before I come to see what they say, I think perhaps it's time to ask Shakufe um, one question that I suspect she might have wanted me to ask earlier. And it's really back to her period of imprisonment. And what did you think, Shakufe, about having any rights of legal representation um, while you were in prison? and before the <coughs> contemplation of something like um, the Iran Tribunal uh, was ever born? 
uh, it was, uh, I guess, five, six years, six years after my arrest, that uh, we heard, um, we, me, my cellmates and me, we heard about that there, uh, about the, that, uh, that political opposition outside of the country, bringing out the idea of uh, prisoners having, should have a right to lawyers. That idea, when we heard it, it was very strange, strange to us um, that even you can think of such claim or such thinking of you have such a right. What we were actually, within, and when, I, when we debated that among ourselves, we thought that actually what we need is to have a right of being released after we even have served our sentences. Uh, no matter how they gave it to us, because uh, the word that I was in at that moment, it was composed of the uh, prisoners who had finished their sentence, but they were kept still in the prison, or who ever even didn't have any sentence at all. And they were acquitted from the beginning, but they still were in, this, uh, in the jail. So what we wanted, it was just even the right of being released after finishing your sentences. So the, rather than thinking about the laws, what was important for us it was about the public opinion outside. That if there was any public opinion outside, is strong enough to bring the, our case to the attention of, um, as you mentioned, to the uh, UN um, delegates or the UN offices or anything. But that was the moment that we, after five, six years in 1987, that we were thinking of if legal representation had any sense or not, or just being released after serving the sentences, if uh, they are uh, right. Can I interrupt you just to ask you this little supplementary question? Um, on eventual release, what did you think of the law that had allowed you to be imprisoned and tortured for so long? It's a weird question even today. I, there wasn't any laws. I mean, it, I, can't, I can't even feel that question now. It didn't exist, yeah. that kind of uh, ability to think about a law that would allow you to be tortured. Of course the law would torture you. That was, that was the, that of course their law was against people. All <laughs> that, right. Uh, a little amplification later, because we got a, we're doing quite well on time, and you'll be able to amplify points that you think I've cut you short on, if any. The tribunal, like the Japanese tribunal, had to find its jurisdiction. It's not a country, it's not an international organization. <coughs> and it charged uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran with crimes against humanity, being obliged to determine whether there were violations of human rights and breach of international rights. It found its um, jurisdiction in just the same way as the Japanese tribunal had done in the people it was to represent. The verdict it reached, well, I'll read it to you, but I, it's, it's not working. Well. Thank you very much, James. The, the verdict it reached was that the Islamic Republic of Iran, thank you very much, had committed crimes against humanity in the period 1980 to 1989 against its own citizens, that Iran bears the absolute responsibility for gross violations of human rights that customary international law holds the Islamic Republic of Iran fully accountable. The tribunal had the courage to make that judgment because no official body had dared to investigate these events. May they yet. A postscript before I return to Shakufe. By interesting coincidence, Iran is the subject of a lot of publicity at the moment. Has it changed? 
is the warm embrace that we can see fully justified. The new president, Rouhani, on the 2nd of July of 1980, in a speech to Parliament, asked for public execution of the enemies of the state. Has been a member of the National Security Council since 1989, with an immensely wide range of responsibilities that must make it quite impossible that he didn't know and who knows, was involved in what was going on. This man, Mustafa Pur Mohammadi, is a member of Rouhani's government. He's a minister. Unfortunately, he was a member of one of the death commissions that went round deciding who was for summary execution. In the normal spirit of participation, I invite one of you to tell me which ministerial portfolio this man holds. Justice. Correct. The judiciary is said to be an independent political institution, but its head is appointed by the present supreme Ayatollah Khamenei, pronunciation uncertain. Since Rouhani took office this August, Iran has executed more than 200 people. Two weeks ago, 16 Baluchis, again pronunciation uncertain by me, was officially said to be revenge. There was no purported justification for their execution, and I will pass very swiftly over <coughs> the next slide, which then comes to the topic of the next lecture, but that's just to save you from having to look at it. That is modern Iran. Shakufe, I haven't asked you this question in writing, but I wonder if you could answer it, and if you can't, we'll throw the questioning open to the floor. In light of your experience, is there law, apart from the law that says, don't own up? Is there a law, apart from don't, don't own up? It should be, and uh, the law that would hold the, the states and the governments accountable, I don't think exists, and, uh, and I, but I think that you said at the beginning of your lecture that laws deal with the rules human introduced to contain and control some of what we are. And the good question is that, but control for what? And that's what I think the, the laws should do. Control what and for what? That's what I think after all of this going through, going through the experience of the Iran tribunal and knowing more about the, uh, actually the power that the law can have and it doesn't actually, it doesn't have or practice. And that's the power of protecting people, the suffering community of humanity. And law should be for that, for the protection of the citizens, of citizens of countries and citizens of the global world, responsible to the people. Thank you. Uh, but I can, I'm going to, thank you very much. I'm going to, uh, we've now got 12 minutes for questions. Shakufe, with so much to say, responded to my invitation to be concise in her answers. If anybody wants to ask a question or make a comment, make it in one sentence. And Shakufe, or possibly I, will deal with it. Hi, I'm very sorry what happened to you. Uh, 
that you are using of um, Islamic um, belief system. I would like to ask you whether you have um, any personal belief in God or in that. And obviously it wasn't said, but um, those people claim that they fought against enemy of the state in the name of God. So I just would like to ask you about it. Right, thank you. Do you have a comment on that, Shagufe? I'm sorry, I didn't understand, I didn't hear the question well. The question's about so, belief in God and the people who were fighting in the name of God. Do you have any comment on the religious aspects of what happened to you and what was the underlying cause of the conflict? And if not, we'll move on to something else. Um, it, it, that was used by the government during the 1988 of uh, the 1988 massacre. Uh, that they gave them uh, permission to uh, kill whoever was fighting against the God. I don't think that is a law. It's a, a judgment, a religious judgment, but not a law. And, and it came and it left. It, they used it, and then after they purged the, pr the prisoners, their opposition, then they took it off. It's Thank you. Thank you very much for um, being here tonight. Uh, I know that your PhD um, focuses on political resistance that does not devolve into that which it resists. Obviously, the revolution started as resistance against the um, autocratic government of the Shah. And do you think it's possible for uh, another resistance against um, this government in Iran? And do you think it's possible that it wouldn't actually devolve into uh, the same sort of thing, but with a, a different label? Would you please repeat the question for me? This sound has an echo I can't hear well. Can you repeat it, sorry? Uh, yes, I just wanted to know whether it's possible for um, a resistance, a political resistance, again, in Iran to um, Basically. Did you? Thank you. Did you hear that? Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, I cannot predict anything like that. But it's always to have resistance. Resistance exists. Resistance happened during the 2009 um, uprising after the um, previous ele um, presidential election, and it's still happening. Resistance takes a lot of forms, uh, but as a major uprising, a revolution. One thing that the Iranian population, I think, that experienced was first the failure of the last revolution, and second uh, the result of that failure, so which was the ruling of the very suppressive government. So, resisting for what now is a good question that I think it's very present on people's mind. Is not just resistance against this government, but for what and to bring what? That question hasn't been answered. I guess that's something of more all of us are dealing with it around the world. Shukufe, thank you very much for being with us tonight. My question is this, how do you assess the mood of the people who are suffering now and, and their families as well? Because it's not just people who are in prison, but their families as well. How do you assess the mood of the people? Is it one of fear? Or is it hopelessness of, you know, is there anywhere they can report these atrocities or are they fearful of? Or Did you hear that, Chigufe? If it's, there is hopelessness, fear or, yes. or uh, the, the mood of the people. Uh, I think there is no either and or. I think it's a combination of all. And uh, what is happening actually right now, which is very different than the 1980s, it's exactly this uh, global communication, the possibility of having communicating between inside and the outside. What we have now is direct connection between the citizen, between the people, the families of the prisoners, of those who have been executed. Uh, they can connect, communicate, connect to the, uh, the, the larger, uh, pe uh, larger community with the diaspora and the concerned people of the world, not even just the Iranian diaspora. 
and that gives hope. At the same time, things are not easy, it's not predictable, and always have, uh, there's always fluctuation in what you get and what you lose. Uh, if it's hopeful, I think hope is for the hopeless. If the people are hopeless, yes, and what can you have more than, I mean, beside hope when you are hopeless? It's frustrating. Uh, some people uh, feel defeated, and there were a lot of families of the 1980s, and today even, the families of the recent prisoners, that they live in silence and suffer in silence. There were a lot who never got their voice out, they never had a voice, and it died in the, in the silence. All of these exist, and all of this gives us the reason to do what we're doing and to ask more. And I think, and if I can inter interpose a question that I suspect Skuhe would like to answer, it, it's this, what do you expect, what do you hope to come out of this informal tribunal and its verdict that may not have happened with other tribunals of which you're aware and to one of which we referred today? What I would like to see that it does not, um, that the tribunal doesn't, it, it doesn't end uh, after it's been done. Uh, the causes is still there. The reasons for continue and uh, to continue this effort or this campaign is still there. We managed to have people to come out to get a recognition, an international recognition that their suffering existed. That was something that had been denied of the 1980s generation. That nobody, not national and not even international, uh, no formal institution recognized their suffering. They achieved that as much as they did. But then it needs more. We need to do more. And we need actually to, my hope is, to, that this goes beyond the Iranian situation. We live, as Zygmunt Bauman says, in, in the time of the interregnum, and that's the time that people suffer. People are suffering from all around the world, and the law should now, and this tribunal should take the cause of being the voice for these people rather than holding the order. Thank you. It may be that if there are no more questions, I'll close this, but with a couple of observations. If anybody's got something they particularly want to raise, two more, three more, one sentence questions, and no more. Uh, well, the question is basically, do, would you, are you happy with the verdicts of the human tribunal, or would you prefer the route to have gone through something like the International Criminal Court? Thank you. Let's take Andrew Bumber's question as well, and then the gentleman over there. Um, when you first became aware, <coughs> when you first began to think about a possible legal response to your situation, were you thinking primarily of your own condition and being relieved from it, or did you also think about some legal response against the people who were uh, torturing you on a daily basis? And as a supplementary, did you actually think those people themselves were trapped by the system? This gentleman, I think we'll the gentleman over there, and then we will call it a day. Can you take three questions at one go? If, if you can, I didn't hear either of them. Can you? Oh. <laughs> one is whether you'd rather it was dealt with at the International Criminal Court. Yes. You would. Yes, of course. <laughs> Andrew, can you repeat your question in one sentence? About whether uh, you thought that the legal response should be to save her from the situation and also to punish the people. Yes. The, the question is, is what you seek from the law protection of yourself or punishment of the others? Okay. All right. Are we taking the next one too? Or yeah, next, next one. One, to one sentence, sir. No more. Uh, my, my question is, is the tribunal convened? Uh, to follow the laws of Sharia as understood by the Islamists, by the Iranian state. Did you hear that? No. Following the Sharia law, 
Is the tribunal obliged to, did you say, or does it? Yes, I mean, uh, as, as interpreted by Iran. As interpreted is by it, Iran. Is it uh, uh, conforming to the laws of Sharia? I, I, don't, I think I know the answer to that, because it was set up under international norms. One last question, Shakufe, and then we really will call it a day. There was a gentleman there who wanted to ask. Thank you very much. Further answers do you have, Shakufe, and then we will close this. Okay. Uh, about the International Criminal Courts, of course. Actually, it's, uh, it's a shame that it has limited itself uh, to the cases after 2002. And the protection, if I want the legal, or uh, what I expect is it protection of myself, uh, or protection from torture or punishment, it's, uh, it's a protection and upholding the power accountable. It's not much about punishment for me, but accountability and responsibility towards citizens. And uh, the state and the laws both, which would bring protection of the people, protection of what they suffered their experience in the past, and that would secure the protection of the next generations and other people around the world. So it's more that. About the Sharia law, I, have, I can't say anything about that. Sharia law, every uh, clergy can uh, interpret the Sharia law differently, and uh, they can use it as, uh, as the power wants it. I don't know if you're aware of not, but the recent case was uh, a man who was hung uh, to, for execution after 15 minutes being on the... Uh, there, he uh, and transferred to the morgue, he woke up. So one of the clergy gave the, uh, the verdict that uh, according to Sharia law, he should be put back on the hanging, take to the gallow again and be hung again. And so another then there was a public opinion. There was a lot of the, um, the issue came to the attention of the uh, international media. And then another one came and said, no, we're not going to do it this time. So you tell me about the Sharia law and its uh, validity. Okay. Uh, when it, thank you. Let me just close this. And if at the end you wish to signify gratitude, it will not be to me. It will be to Shakufe. But through her and through the history of this particular tribunal and the tragedy that gave rise to it, several things arise. One, the law barely exists. It did not exist for the best part of a decade for people in Shakufe's position. Second, International organizations and national organizations cannot be trusted to protect and defend the interests of the ordinary citizen if it doesn't suit their book. Third, the citizen now has much more power, whether it's in tribunals of this kind or, as I read recently, um, a People's Commission to determine the future of Lewisham Hospital. Why not? A and accountability and indeed the leaving of a record, which I think were, was implicit in the values Shakufe ascribed to the sort of tribunal that we've been dealing with, are things that the citizen can now achieve if governments don't do it for them. And as Shakufe would argue, that should be for the protection or the better protection of people to come. My next lecture, consistent with this one, is to be more interactive. The content of it is set by somebody of the audience in the summer. So if you want to come and be interactive, whatever that means, <laughs> the next lecture. The rest of the lectures of this series will also try to make space for the audience to contribute because little can be less satisfying than to address an audience about something as practical or 
impractical as the law when there are more interesting aspects of the law to explore. To Shakufe, who's joined us from Canada, to the staff who managed to make it possible, but principally to Shakufe, an immense vote of thanks. <laughs>